Hey there everyone, I am Jeff, this is Tabletop Toolbox, and I am happy to bring you episode number 25 of the weekly Ratchet. Today's theme is hasta la vista, which I'll get to here in a little bit, but did you know that that's a fairly positive saying? It doesn't really have the negative undertones of the Terminator movies. It means see you later, or until we meet again, or see you soon, which kind of made me wonder, how soon? Like next year, next week, maybe after this musical break? And here we are, ladies and gentlemen, at a time that I will call soon. <laughs> hey there, folks, and welcome to the Weekly Ratchet. Thanks for tuning in. I'm glad to see you as always. Uh, you know, a couple things to cover here in the episode. It's been a fairly straightforward week, a lot of filming over the weekend. I did finish up a preview video for Final Nine at the Disc Golf Game that will go up uh, tomorrow, I believe, or at least by Wednesday when the campaign goes active. So please do check that one out. I had a little bit of fun working on that one with my daughter doing a little disc golfing here in our backyard. Uh, other than that, not a lot of stuff here at the top of the episode. I only got one game recently, so I'll go ahead and mention that now. This is Win, another one of these small Paco games from Chris Handy. And I've usually kind of mentioned these fairly quickly, but this, this one's been getting a fair amount of attention out on the social media groups and such on the board gaming uh, you know, pages and whatnot. And I think it's because this is kind of the ongoing shrinking of the Ready, Set, Bet game. A very popular, very animated, very high energy, sort of a social party game that then got shrunk down into a long shot roll and write game and is now represented in this tiny little card game with the title of Win, a horse betting game. Uh, and it, it has a decent footprint. I got to play this here already, so I'll talk about it here in a little bit. But other than that, let's go ahead and start off with question of the week. In honor of the 2024 Olympics, let's go ahead and dive right in with question of the week. This week, I asked you sort of a two prong approach. The first one was, you know, what keeps you coming back to the table? What keeps you playing games, going back to games and, you know, continuing to participate in the hobby? And then I also asked if there was any moment in your past when you had thought about giving up on the hobby, sort of throwing in the towel, so to speak, and giving up on gaming. And I got a variety of responses. You'll see a lot of common themes coming out of these. Uh, uh, but you know, still a variety of answers. Let's go ahead and kick things off, and I'll tell you as well that uh, I'm gonna have to enlarge the text box on some of these because I got a lot of long responses, and I will do my best to fit them all in on the screen. Up first was Teshra, who said what keeps him coming back is the sense of discovery, like discovering new games, then unboxing new games, then playing new games, and discovering new characters, scenarios, mechanics, and more. I think that's a really good perspective, and I think you're gonna see a lot of that theme sort of repeated through the rest of these comments. For example, CR Pohl said he enjoys playing games for fun and occasionally to kill time, and that he especially enjoys the games like Ticket to Ride, where he can have his own goals but still be playing in a group competition, which sounds to me, CR Pohl, like you are definitely a Euro gamer at heart. Uh, curious to see what other Euro games you like to play. Omar Hernandez said it's all about the variety of options, experiences, and again, discoveries. He can play in space, go farming, survive a desert island, and more, and that he loves the wealth of options. I think that's a really good uh, point there, Omar, again, with the discoveries and, and having lots of options available. It's, it's sort of amusing when you get done with a game day and you think about just all the different things that you did in that day. Again, you know, farming and playing in space and conquering civilizations and running a dinosaur park or whatever else. I can certainly agree with that one. Jeremy Brooks said that he's considered dropping out of the hobby at times when he struggled to find other players. But then he lands a good game night and it brings him right back, saying that you can't beat the experience of people across the table from each other off their phones interacting together. I can certainly agree with that, Jeremy. Uh, and you know, that's one thing that we saw a bit even in the uh, either the previous episode or the one before talking about, uh, you know, what you could what you would change about your hobby your interaction with the hobby, if you could. A lot of folks said they wish they could find more gamers. And I tell you, God, I wish I had some answers for that. That's something I'm kind of working through right now. Kay said that what keeps her coming back are the memories with her son and the challenge of figuring out new games, but also shared an experience that almost ended her gaming hobby when she became the target of ridicule on a board game geek post. 
Kay, I'm so sorry that you had to experience that. I think a lot of us have probably experienced that as well. I even remember C.R. Pohl talking about some board game snobs and how they kind of, uh, you know, changed his impression for a little while of gaming. I, I've done a lot of different hobbies from, you know, the sort of car collecting to brewing beer to disc golf. And in all of those hobbies, there are always those people who just want to find ways to sort of ruin the hobby for everyone else. They feel that they are elitist, they feel that they are the cream of the crop, and they just like to ruin the fun for everyone else. And I'd like to say, especially from my perspective and everyone else out there, f those people. <laughs> I can't stand them, and I wish they would go away. Rentless said that he wanted to make a smart, complicated answer, but he just loves sitting at a table with good people playing games. And I would love to make a smart, sophisticated response, but you pretty much nailed it. Penny5636 said they love discovering new mechanisms and themes, love unboxing new games, but most of all, loves engaging their minds while spending time with family and friends. You know, and again, that's that's uh, some of some of the themes that we've already seen is just getting to you know be with other people. But that's another thing that came out in some of these comments was the the sort of brain itch, the brain scratch, however you want to call it, just the that sort of fun of diving into these mental puzzles of these games and getting that good crunchy thinky feeling in your head. I can certainly agree with that. Juan Pablo Pagan said that they struggle with making and keeping friends, and so gaming has been a way to socialize more as it's easier to break the ice over games and relieve some anxiety when it comes to meeting new people. They also said that they really enjoy the tactile experience of board games over video games. And that's that's a really good point too, and that was something that kind of, uh, I sort of skirted over last week talking about playing games online, that that's you know, something that you're able to do more than playing games in person. It still counts as gaming, but there is definitely that missed tactile experience and I have certainly experienced that myself. Mary Beth Boyd said that she is so fortunate that her and her spouse Ben share the same love of gaming and they can share so much more together over a tabled game than they can when watching TV. I completely agree with that. I can certainly say that I have had a lot more fun even in just the past year or so when my wife and I sit and play a game, maybe even with the TV on in the background. I love to watch some Big Bang Theory, just kind of have that noise going. Uh, but I enjoy that so much more than when we're sitting there listening to the TV more often just kind of staring at our phones. So I can certainly side with you on that one. Board Game Vibes said that they too considered quitting the hobby when they struggled to find other gamers, as they mentioned in a post last week, but that the excitement of new themes and adapting to new games, and they love how much variety there is to enjoy with different themes that uh, keeps them coming back out to the hobby. It is Definitely difficult to resist a new exciting theme. And I think it's been really neat in past years to see some new themes coming to light. You know, we've had games about trimming a bonsai tree, uh, you know, games about disc golf, that kind of stuff that seems new and seems inviting and just uh, fresh ideas that are certainly been pretty neat to check out. Jamie Wiley said that he loves the process of learning new games, that the moment he gets a game, it's like a dopamine rush. I have experienced that myself too. For me, it's it's a little bit of when I get a game, but it's also when I'm playing a game for the first time and I think I'm doing pretty well and I realize as I'm starting to kind of look around and look at what's going on and I think I might actually be winning this one. I might actually have a shot of this. I remember playing uh, the, the follow-up to Scythe um, Expeditions at the Dice Tower Retreat last year. It was a really, really long game. It was really dragging out forever. Uh, but I was kind of looking around, I started to realize, I, I think I'm actually winning this one. I think I got a lot of points here in front of me, and I did win it. And I was literally getting like a little a little anxious. I was kind of shaking a little bit because it was a drawn out experience. I was kind of getting flustered at how long the game was taking. But then having that excitement to think that it, it might sort of pay off in the end, and it was giving me that that you know, adrenaline rush, which was really kind of interesting. It was a very thrilling sensation, so I can I can see that. Andrew Gelling shared a few responses that we've seen already, such as community and personal interaction with other folks, but he also mentioned the enjoyment of the mental challenge of learning new things, opening and creating new brain pathways. So like I said, another common theme that uh, was in some of these comments was, yeah, getting to play with folks, but also just that sort of wrapping your head around that mental puzzle. You know, so much of what we do every day is, sort of tedious and monotonous where, you know, we have a lot of routines. And so when you can break up those routines and sink yourself into a challenge, a puzzle, something that you don't normally do, I can certainly see that as a positive experience. 
Mark B said that he's considered giving up on gaming as well with so many unplayed games in his possession and not enough folks to game with, saying they can be a lonely hobby at times. He said that it's the positive experiences, the memorable game nights, the puzzly buzz he gets from those experiences and those games, the escapism and the belly laughs from a good game night that keep him coming back. There have been some great comments here, and I basically agree with all of these. I, I think that that table talk and having other folks there is a lot of fun. I, I do like to meet new people. That, of course, can be a little anxiety-inducing for sure. I certainly love sitting and playing with you know well-established friends and, of course, family. I, I've had a lot of fun gaming with my sister and, of course, my wife over the past several years. I do think, for me, it's a little bit more about that mental challenge. I do love sitting down to a new game, whether it's a game that I've got or something that someone is introducing me to. I like that idea of trying to right away figure out what my first couple of moves are gonna be. What is that first step that I should take? What should I start focusing on right away? What's gonna maybe either set me ahead or at least keep me in the running of this game that I'm not familiar with. It's my first time playing and I want to do well. Uh, I also love that mental scratch, you know, that, that, that puzzle of a new game. I love what gaming has enabled me to do as an adult, for lack of a better phrase, I have certainly felt over the past couple of years that I've gotten better at organizing myself. I've gotten better at speaking in public. I've gotten better at, you know, teaching folks new ideas, whether it's, you know, sort of teaching somebody what I do or trying to convince someone to see my point of view on something. I feel like to some extent, gaming has helped me out with that, whether it's teaching someone a new game, uh, maybe trying to help someone with a strategy, not that I'm a pro at that by any means, but you know, that idea of communicating with folks uh, in one aspect or another, I think has improved for me because of gaming. Uh, and it certainly helped me with, you know, even interacting with my family, interacting with my daughter. I feel like it has just kind of helped me to be a little smarter, you know, a little more in tune to what I want to be able to accomplish and what I want to be able to get across to other folks, if that makes sense. I mentioned last week that this kind of had a precursor, that there was a reason for this question of the week. And that reason is, is that my good buddy Daniel, who I've mentioned many times here on the channel, has decided to quit gaming. Uh, I'm not really going to go into his reasons for that. Those are his reasons, you know, and I'll, I'll let those be his. But um, I've known him for many years. Uh, I sort of poached him from a game group unintentionally, really. I was trying to get a prototype played of Pampero, I think two years ago. And sort of met him at a game up, uh, gaming group, meetup group, and I said, hey, do you want to come out just next week and let's let's try out Pampero? And he did, and he was looking around this room of games, and he thought, well, and he said, well, hey, next week, can we play this? And I said, yeah, yeah, sure, we can play that next week. And so we came out next week, we played another game, and he goes, well, next week, let's play that. And I was like, hang on a second, is, is this going to be a thing? Like, are we, are we making our own meetup group? And he kind of did. He just sort of, sort of, made himself at home here, which was awesome. I mean, it was fantastic. One thing it meant, I didn't have to go anywhere. And I was more than happy to host, you know, him here. We we just clicked real well together. We certainly has have some different gaming interests. You know, he did not like Scoville at all. And I didn't really care for Brass Birmingham. And we definitely have had some some differing, differing interests in games. But it has been a blast getting to play with him. And I, I didn't look up statistics. We've probably played over a hundred different games together. And it's it's been a great experience. And I'm certainly very, very sad to see him go. Uh, he just sort of, sort of said that he just wasn't really loving gaming anymore. And, uh, you know, I'm not going to try and change his mind on that. That's his opinion. And, and I'm, I'm going to respect him as a friend and, and let him, you know, obviously do what he wants to do. I, I hope he'll come back. I'd love to see him back. It's certainly going to be difficult for me to keep getting new games played. Uh, I've already started to reach out for new options, trying to meet some new folks, maybe trying to set up some new groups. I created a meetup group today, actually, although I realized how expensive meetup is. And uh, so, yeah, I don't know what I'm going to do quite yet. I, I still have lots of games to get played, and I still have lots of things I need to do. I'm not going anywhere. The Weekly Ratchet's not going anywhere. Tabletop Toolbox isn't going anywhere. But if I need to make, if I if I want to make these things thrive, then I better come up with a quick plan B. So that is what's going on here. Uh, for next week, you know, 
I, I hesitated even doing a question of the week. Daniel never posted here, and I thought maybe I would just kind of go a week of radio silence, but that's not what the Ratchet is really about. I want to have conversations with the folks, and I certainly appreciate all the conversations I've had with all of you. So I'm going to do a little bit of a lighter comment or lighter question of the week for next week, and I'm going to simply ask, do you sleeve your cards? What do you think about card sleeving? Uh, yeah, I think it's going to be about it. Tell me about sleeving cards. It's a boring one, but whatever. I'm going to roll with it. Let's get to some recently played games. Okay, well, hopefully I can kind of lighten the mood here just a little bit because that was definitely a, you know, a little smidge of a downer for me to get through. But uh, again, I appreciate all of you being here. I appreciate all your just interaction and feedback. Let me go ahead and chat about some recently played games. And I'm excited for this new one. And I'm going to actually, I'm going to holler out, Kay, Kay, are you watching? Because I think you might be interested in this one. This game is called Nebula. I have no idea who it's by. Christian Bustos and Bernardo Vasquez. I probably butchered those, and I apologize. This is from a Spanish, I believe. Uh, the, the company is Fractal Juegos. I hope I'm saying that right. Anyways, let me get to it. I got this from the Dice Tower last year at the Dice Tower retreat when I was down at the studios and uh, Tom just kind of like, yeah, pick a couple games. Here, do you want this? Do you want this? Do you want this? And of course, it's a space game. And uh, so I jumped on it. This is very similar to games like Cascadia. Yeah, not even Cascadia, a little bit more like Calico. It has a lot of Azul sort of inspiration in it and it also reminds me a bit of the new Harmonies game. But it is still very different from all of those. Uh, it's one of those kind of pattern building, pattern filling in kind of games. You're taking these plastic stars from this bag that go out onto a board on your turn. You're sort of moving around these like hourglass time figurines to then claim some of these stars. They go into a sort of a personal supply, and then you can play anywhere from two to three of those stars onto your personal constellation board. Your board has four different constellations represented on it, and the constellations have direct links between those stars. There are also indirect links to other constellations, and then there are orbit lines that sort of connect all of these together. And you're, as you're taking these stars, you're putting them on your board. Your first one has to start in the center, and then you can put stars onto any other space that is connected from a direct link, an indirect link, or an orbital link to another location. So you're, you're starting the center and you're sort of branching out in these other constellations. But no two stars sharing a direct or indirect or an orbital link can be of the same color. And so some of these places connect to four other stars. And so you really have to be mindful of what's going on and where, what you're putting where and what's connected to what and what you can or can't put in each of these places. And that's just the placement puzzle. There are then four cards that players are sort of racing to achieve, four goals out on the main board that you're trying to meet. The first player who gets it done gets the most points, and then everyone else gets sort of a second level, a second tier of score for each of those cards. You also have two personal objectives that you are working towards. And then in the advanced mode, which, which my wife and I played, there are three other tracks that you can move these little tokens on, and depending on which token is ahead is how much those goals are worth. So the top one is just for the color of each star. And you may have the blue one furthest up on the track, which means the blue stars, each blue star that you have is worth four points or seven points, whatever it is. And then depending on the placement of those other tokens, your stars may not be worth anything, or maybe just one point, maybe two points, whatever. There are also points that you can get for filling in the constellations, for completing a constellation. But again, the points are only worth depending on where those tokens make it on those tracks. And then there are also four additional objectives that come out, and you can sort of set what each of those is worth by moving up these various tokens. There's also these black stars you get. They sort of sit at the top of your constellation board, and they're just worth points at the end of the game for how far you kind of get that track filled in. This thing set our heads on fire. And what was really especially interesting was that I thought I was doing quite well. I had one or two of the race objectives met. Uh, I was kind of struggling with my personal objectives. I was working on a couple of those other tracks, you know, the varying scoring tracks. I was working on a couple of those. And my wife clobbered me in this game. She did not think she was doing that well at all. Uh, and so it's one of those where you really just don't know what the score is until the end of the game. 
I liked this. I like this quite a bit. Uh, you know, again, a very abstract sort of a puzzly pattern filling in game. Uh, this is going to be at Gen Con this year, I think, as a demo. I believe it's going to be finally coming out here in the U.S. Again, this is, in fact, if you look at the back of this, which you probably can't read from there, of course, Everything's in Spanish. <laughs> um, luckily, the rule book in here is in English, and it did have a pack of Spanish cards and a pack of English cards. So I've got a fully playable copy here. Uh, but this is pretty neat, and I'm curious to see what this one's going to do, especially based on that success of Harmonies, with this being sort of that space genre that certainly attracts a different type of gamer. I think this might do fairly well, so keep an eye out for Nebula. All right, up next, I went to a game night on Thursday since I didn't have my usual gaming plans here. And I uh, went to a local brewery called Three Notch, and I got to meet up with my buddy Chris Mutton, who has commented here uh, in the past. We played two games. We play, played The Great Split. This is by Homer Hawk, and I did not realize this was a Homer Hawk game. Homer Hawk made Photosynthesis and Evergreen, two games that I have certainly talked about in the past. This is one of those... I split you choose games. Uh, and the, the teach was a little bit more obtuse than I expected it to be. And I actually meant to look this up and I forgot to. I don't know if you're collectors in this game or if you're thieves and you're sort of splitting up the recent you know, catch that you've managed to, or heist that you've managed to steal. I, I'm not quite sure on that. But basically, you're trying to collect various items. There's gems, there's like statue busts, there's gold, there's books, and there may be one other thing that I'm forgetting. And you get a number of cards, you look at the cards that you have, and then you put a divider, you can reorganize them, and you put a divider in between them, and you pass them to the player on your left, and they look at sort of the two different stacks of cards that you have made based on where your divider is, and they decide what they want to keep and what they're going to give back to you. Meanwhile, of course, you've received a batch from the player on your right, and so you keep half of what they've given you, you get half back of what you had sent over, and then those are the things that you score. And you're simply moving up these tracks to indicate what you have, and there's a bunch of different scoring I'm not going to go into, but you know the, the, the main tracks of what you've collected will give you points, but then there's also these ribbon tracks at the bottom of the player boards, and they sort of indicate, um, they sort of provide a multiplier. So if you're up the busts statue ribbon track and the bust track, you kind of multiply those together at the end of the game to get a bunch more points. This also reminded me a bit of Hadrian's Wall. Hadrian's Wall is a sort of a flip and right game, if you will, and it just has all these different tracks that you're trying to climb up. You're Xing off these things on these score sheets. And there's a lot of, well, if you go up here, then it moves you up this. And if this bumps you up, this might bump you up here as well. And there's a lot of that in this game. But there's also a lot of heads down just managing your own board. And it's very easy in this game to sort of look up and realize that someone is suddenly way ahead on something and you have no idea how they did it or how they got there. Did they play things correctly? Did they, you know, maybe give themselves something that they, they shouldn't have because they, they forgot that they already did it? You know, stuff like that. Uh, and I just, I didn't really like that in Hadrian's Wall and I definitely did not like that with The Great Split. Uh, again, the scoring was really kind of funky. You spend three rounds working towards one goal and then you only get one more round to work on the next goal then you get another two or three rounds to work on all the goals and it just kind of pulled you in a bunch of different directions of course it all just down to the luck of what cards you get and what cards get passed to you i was actually trying to split things fairly fair so it really didn't matter what i was going to get back i'd be happy with it uh, but even then it's just kind of a crapshoot as to what you're going to get done the the player to my left got very little done did not score that many points at all uh, even though, like I said, I was trying to be fair in how I split things up. So, I don't know. It was neat to play this. Uh, I had heard about it a while ago. It was fine. The Great Split by Homer Hawk. I also played a game of Harmonies that night. Uh, and I've mentioned this many times. I won't get into this one. I didn't do as well with this, but I still came in second place, which I thought was kind of weird. Uh, a couple of folks that we played with were fairly experienced. Ironically, the, the guy who won was sort of playing with his wife at the same time. They were kind of like working together on the same board, if you will. And I don't know if that gave them an advantage because they were kind of able to collaborate and sort of share ideas. I don't know, but they clobbered us. Then, and this was really exciting. So Friday evening after work, I got to play Dino, ooh, this is heavy, Dinogenics, the New Arrivals expansion. And I mentioned this already, but I didn't play on this copy. I played this copy. 
I played online on Tabletop Simulator, and I played with just one opponent, and it was Richard Keen, the designer of Dinogenics. This was a just fantastic experience. So it, with my Ratchet episode of last week, which he actually mentioned that he had seen, and I had also sent him an email just kind of recapping my play of it. Uh, and I mentioned in last week's episode that I felt like the game started to bloat the dinosaur deck. I felt like there was just kind of too many dinosaurs, and when I would try to, you know, draw more cards to get a dinosaur made, I still couldn't get anything done. Uh, and so he offered to play the game with me online on Tabletop Simulator, and just kind of, as he said, kind of helped sell me on some of the new concepts of the game, which I didn't really need. I really like some of the new stuff that's in the game. It's really just that dinosaur deck and the fact that I feel like there is so much stuff in there now, it you can't really get stuff done. Uh, so anyways, we played it together, and I actually asked to kind of keep it at two because that's how I normally play it at and the game is a little tighter at two. A lot of your worker placement Scott spots get blocked out. I had a great game with this. It was a really neat experience. Really, really enjoyed this. I did play it very differently. I did kind of try to work more with what I had and not necessarily work too hard to try and find the dinosaur that I wanted to get played. Uh, there were a couple times he's like, yeah, you could really use an Ankylosaur right now. And I said, yeah, that'd be great. I've never seen an Ankylosaur card in this entire playthrough. But, uh, you know, again, I tried to do some things differently from how I normally play. He beat me as very well he should have, but I was fairly close behind, I think maybe six points or so. And uh, it was a really, like I said, a really, really neat experience. I really enjoyed getting to play with him. Richard is definitely, I don't know if this is normal for his nature, but obviously he knows the game very well, clearly. He knows the systems of the game. And a lot of the comments he was making were ones along the lines of, well, this is, you know, a few bucks for this many points. This is, you know, maybe more points, but at a higher cost. And he was sort of, you know, relying on those ratios, like what really is your your cost to income kind of ratio. And I'm, I'll admit, I'm not very good at that. I can certainly say, you know, well, if I go here and take this action, I'll get two points. If I go here and I take this action, I'll get four points. That's the better option. But when it comes to weighing costs versus rewards, I'm not as good at that. I'll go here and spend $8 to get four points when I could go here and only spend $2 to get three points. It's less points, but it's less cost to me. And maybe if that money is worth something later, that might make it worth that one point difference. And I'm just, I'm not as strong at that. And there were a couple times even that I said, well, you know what, I'm gonna go ahead and go with my gut reaction. I'm probably wrong and that's okay. I want to play with this system. I want to check out this aspect. It, uh, had a great time playing this. And thanks again to Richard if he sees this for giving me that opportunity. Still absolutely love this game. And with the final nine review finish, which I'm actually going to mention that one here in just a second, uh, I will be focusing on the preview video for Dinogenics. Really excited to do that one. Next game I played was Final Nine, upside down. Uh, <laughs> I've mentioned this one also, I think, last week, uh, and I just finished up a preview video here in the channel, as I've already mentioned. My wife and I did want to try the Ace Run, which is kind of a speed run version of this game. You use a lot of the base game components, but you do use some cards from some of the, uh, from the new expansion. And the idea is that you only throw one shot per hole, and you're just trying to get an ace, trying to get a hole in one. Uh, and it was pretty neat. Unfortunately, you still run into the situation where you have a handful of discs that just don't do you any good. They're too short of a range. Uh, and at that point, it's very hard to trade because maybe my wife only has one driver and she doesn't want to get rid of it, which I certainly understand. Uh, but it, it was difficult. I mean, I finished with, I think, three points. I only got three holes in one in nine holes. 33%, not that bad. My wife got one, and it does use an element where when you actually hit the chains, you have to draw a card to see if it actually catches, if it stays in the basket. And I got skunked on one of those. She got skunked on at least two of them. So it could have been four to three, maybe. Um, but, uh, you know, just the, the luck of the draw kind of kind of knocked it down. So we, we didn't really enjoy that as much as we were hoping to. It was a quicker experience, which was nice, but... I think I still kind of prefer just the base game of Final Nine. Then we played Win, uh, as I already mentioned. This is, I think of all these Chris Handy games, it probably has the largest footprint, uh, being even a little bit larger, I think, in overall play space than the game of Bus uh, from, from Chris Handy as well. 
uh, and this one was kind of neat because you have to actually build a racetrack. You are tracking your money along the top of this track. And then you also have a bookie that you're sort of keeping track of two main bids that you can manage. You've got, you know, obviously money you got to manage. You've got actions that you can take. These action cards kind of come out and you can use them to either get money or manipulate the horse a little bit or place a bid. Like there's a lot of stuff going on. The rules were a little difficult to sort through, but I think we figured it out. And uh, I basically pushed really hard for the number six horse, which has really high payout ratios. And that horse came in second place and I got a ton of money off of it. So that was kind of cool. That was neat to play this. We played at the local center of the universe brewing company. Uh, still was able to play it easily on the bar top and had a good game of win. The next two games I don't have, but I got invited to a, uh, a game day yesterday, Sunday here in town. A good friend of mine, Mike Gallo, who I've been playing with for a little while. He had a couple games that he was deciding whether or not he wanted to keep, and so he wanted to play them and sort of, you know, refresh himself on whether or not he wanted to keep these games. The first one was Alien Frontiers, and uh, I'm going to bring this here so I have it in front of me. I had seen this before in a game store, and I didn't buy it, but I couldn't remember why. <laughs> when I sat and watched the video from Board Game Geek on how to play it, I remembered why this ha this is an area control game you're trying to control i don't even know what planet i think it's mars and you're trying to you know control these different regions you're using dice as workers you're rolling them at the start of every turn and then based on the values you kind of maybe do different stuff that is one of my least favorite mechanisms in games because <clears throat> there was some mitigation options but they didn't really flesh out until much later in the game and even then i only ended up with two of them i could adjust my dice values down or i could flip a die that was it my buddy mike could send values up or maybe up and down i don't remember and the guy next to me had all kinds of stuff he was able to do uh and then it also has what was the other aspect that i didn't like I don't Oh, it's just a lot of take that. So there's a lot of stealing stuff in this game. There's a lot of obviously bumping people out of an area majority, but then also there is a simple space where you can go and steal things, just simply take things from other players. And I hate that in games so much. Luckily, the very, very first card draw of these alien technology cards gave you a card that prevented anything from being stolen from you except for that card. So if they wanted to steal things, they first had to steal that card, and then in a later action, they could steal from you again. Of course, if you had not stolen back the card already by them. I took that card, legitimately, I took it from the market, didn't steal it, and a couple times players tried to steal from me, forgetting that I had the card, but the, the, the benefit of stealing resources was much greater than just taking a single card, and so no one ever bothered to take that card from me. And so I was kind of protected for the rest of the game. Uh, what was kind of what, what made this work besides having that card was that I, I did get a lot of stuff going. I was able to generate a lot of points. We ended the game in a three-way tie. The first tiebreaker was whoever had the most agenda cards completed, which I tied with my buddy Mike for three. The then second level of uh, tiebreaker was the most technology cards which I shockingly had. And so I actually won this game, was not expecting that to happen at all. The player to my right was being very, very aggressive, taking people out of very majorities, trying to steal stuff. Like I said, kept trying to take stuff from me, kept forgetting that he couldn't, was irking off a couple players around the table to the point that we all kind of went after him towards the end of the game, knocking him back out of a bunch of area majority, which cost you points. And so he actually finished the game in the last place, which I thought was kind of interesting. Uh, I tried to just kind of play very, even keel, just working on my own stuff, and ended up with the victory. Glad I got to try this. Not a game I'm gonna jump back on anytime soon. The last game we played was Sentinels of the Multiverse. This is a cooperative game, a superhero ripoff game, all right? So I played a female version of Batman, uh, very equipment focused, like Batman. Uh, a lot of very generic comic book art, which is okay. Uh, it's an older game, older than Marvel Champions, and the one player was mentioning that he felt like Marvel Champions ripped off a lot of ideas from this game, which might be true, but Champions is still a way better game. Uh, I was really excited at first. I had a card that I was able to play that let me go through my deck and just pull out any piece of equipment and put it into play, which was great. Uh, except for that on the very next turn, all my equipment got destroyed. So I lost everything I had, which sucked. Uh, and then I got another card. Let me basically do that again. I was like, oh, good. Well, now let me see what all the equipment I have. So I really went through and I started pulling out all the equipment. And I really only had like three good ones and three kind of real basic ones. 
Uh, it's also a game where on your turn you can trigger one power and play one card. And now the player to my right upgraded to the point that he could play three cards. I upgraded to the point that I could trigger two powers and only play one card. And the gentleman across me, I can't remember what all he was able to do, but as soon as I got that second power, I was like, oh, here we go. I'm gonna start build this, building this engine. I'm gonna you know, trigger off a bunch of stuff. And then like six, seven, eight turns later, nothing else new had really come out for me. I was a little more defensive. I could do a little bit more damage on my turn, but that was it. I could still only trigger two powers and only play one card. And I, <clears throat> nothing else in my deck really gave me any more of a special ability. I kept getting more powers, but I could only trigger two of them. And it was, you know, the, the, the ones that made the most sense was, was dealing damage to the, the villain. And that was it. So I, I don't know. I, uh, I was glad to try it. I had certainly heard a lot about it. I mean, this game dates back to, I think, 2017, if not older than that. But I just kind of felt like the buildup in the game happens very, very quickly and then never really gets any bigger than that, except for maybe other characters. I'm not really sure. But that was Sentinels of the Multiverse. And that is the Weekly Ratchet. Thank you so much again for tuning in, folks. Hopefully a fairly quick episode here today. I do have some editing to do because I goofed up a couple of these, <laughs> these clips, but I'm going to roll with it. So thanks for tuning in, and I will see you again next week. Cheers.